Greetings everyone, this is Rob Sanders with Simply Learn and today we're going to talk about Digital Marketing Course. So, so buckle up and let's get started. And so in today's world, everywhere you go, it's all about digital. So today's lecture is going to be about all the different marketing channels available, piece them together, kind of put together a little digital marketing course for you. So. First off, before we get started, we're going to talk about what is digital marketing. And really, digital marketing covers a lot of areas. It's very broad. And really, what it refers to is just marketing that a company does, a person does, an individual, a group, an organization. And they do it in the form of an electronic device or with the aid of the internet. That's really what digital marketing is. It's just having something digitally not something tangible like a billboard or a newspaper or a TV and with that there are lots of places where you can apply digital marketing and so electronic devices we think of mobile devices and so you could certainly use mobile as a form of digital marketing or to help you with your marketing efforts digitally okay you can create apps you can run advertising on mobile. You can communicate with different people, your target audience via different devices like WhatsApp and messaging. Okay. Uh, there's also search engines. Search engines is where a lot of people get their information from, at least start to do their research to get information. You got social media, lots of different social media platforms, all the way from you know tweeting to blogging to social sharing to social content okay so a lot of of platforms under the bucket social media you also have traditional forms of digital marketing like email you can use different email platforms to send out emails so lots of different ways to communicate your product your service your message to a large number of people that are really targeted to your efforts how is digital marketing useful? Well, we know it provides different metrics. Why do we know it provides different metrics? Because it's all digital, okay? So anytime you send out an email or post something on Facebook, you're going to get data back. When you get data back, you could take that data to determine how well that post or that email performed. And if it didn't perform up to expectation, you can make changes to improve performance. That's called optimization. Okay, so that's the great thing about digital marketing. It's useful in that we get data in some cases instantaneously and we're able to make changes in order to optimize that campaign. We can also, you know, provide personalized user experience. So meaning if we know who our target audience is on say Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook, we can really cater our messaging to that group. Probably most importantly is that digital marketing compared to traditional forms of marketing allow us to really reach a global audience very easily very easily at a very low cost that's the key so if I want to target people in India or, or Nepal or Pakistan I can certainly do that and I can do that with the snap of a campaign and I can get data back and based on the data I can tailor that experience even better really just allows us to really hone in on a particular audience anywhere in the world very quickly. So these are just three of the main reasons why digital marketing is useful. Some other experiences or uses for digital marketing, again, it provides a cost-effective alternative to traditional marketing. So, you know, for those that are familiar with purchasing advertising on, say, TV or radio, you have to pick a spot. You have to pick a program and then pick a time slot associated with that program. So somebody's watching a program and, and that program tends to draw on a specific target audience, then you want to show your ad around the time when that program is slotted to air on TV uh, because you know you're likely going to reach your audience. However, to purchase that time slot could be competitive and could be very costly where there are forms of, of advertising and paying for advertising digitally and those forms are cost per click or cost per impression. And so using a cost per click or cost per impression model allows you to really go head to head in kind of an auction style format where 
you can control how much you pay and potentially get that prime spot in front of your target audience. So it really does become cost effective and it allows you to make small investments to get a really substantial return on ROI. So let's just say your cost per click is only 10 cents, but you're selling a product for $10. Well, all you need is one click and one sale to generate a very substantial return on investment. And so knowing that you get metrics back on a campaign, you could slowly or quickly optimize that campaign towards a very positive ROI. And then another use for digital marketing, it just enables targeting users based on their actions and preferences. So again, we can really hone in on who we want to target. It really depends on the platform, but if you take Google ads, for example, and you want to target the display network, well, we know we have demographics. We know we have topics. We know we have interests. We know we have retarget audiences in segment audiences. We have age, we have gender. So you have a lot of options available to choose from to really hone in on who you want to target. And we talk about remarketing is another form of digital marketing. So you can set up a remarketing campaign. So if somebody comes to your website and does not purchase the product or service that you're offering, you could take action on that behavior. So I can retarget a group of people who didn't purchase. That's retargeting or you could do it via remarketing. And basically that's the beauty of digital marketing. It allows you to really target users based on their actions. Some other uses for digital marketing, it helps build brand awareness and reputation of your business. So when we say brand awareness, if you're just launching a company and nobody knows who you are, if we use Google ads as our preferred method of digital marketing and establishing campaigns, we can choose that display network. That display network on Google ads reaches a large amount of people. So you can really get your name out there and really target your intended audience and allow that targeted intended audience to really understand who you are because they're going to see your ad in the form of a banner or in the form of a video or in the form of text. And so that's the beauty of digital marketing. You can really reach a lot of people and a lot of people who might be interested in your product or service. And then digital marketing provides a platform for you to be interactive with your audience, helping you stay relevant and competitive. And the best example I can give here is YouTube. And so YouTube's a really, it's a search engine for videos, but it's a video sharing platform. And so if I upload a video, then I can entice people to comment on that video or like the video or share the video. And I can really interact with that audience by responding to their comments or, you know, putting together a playlist or giving them more videos. Okay. So I can really interact with my audience. And I could do that on multiple platforms, not just YouTube and video. I can blog and, and interact based on somebody's comments. I can have a website and have live chat and interact with my audience. So there's lots of different ways to interact with an audience. And that's what digital marketing provides. So I already mentioned a few examples based on the uses of digital marketing. I mentioned Google's display network. I mentioned YouTube and blogging and social media platforms like Facebook. Well, there are lots of different types of digital marketing channels out there. And we're going to talk about a few of them today. We're going to start with search engine optimization. And so search engine optimization, as you probably know from the name, involves search engine. And it involves really making your site relevant in the eyes of that search engine. So if you're in the United States, you know that Google has a large market share, meaning a lot of people use Google on a daily basis. So we want to make sure we do everything we can to optimize our site in order to make our site relevant for those coveted keywords. Now, why do we want to make ourselves relevant for those coveted keywords that we want to be found for on search? Well, because a lot of people use search and when a lot of people use search and you're found for those keyword queries, then it's going to increase the flow of organic traffic to your website. So the higher you rank, in theory, the more traffic you're gonna get. And so when we talked about optimization, okay, how do we optimize our site in order to be relevant in the eyes of Google? Well, it really comes down to a two-pronged approach. 
you have on-page SEO, you have off-page SEO. On-page has everything to do with your website in order to make it relevant. Off-page has everything to do with your website, but not on your website. It means that how can we become relevant by linking to other websites, for example? How can we become relevant by getting our content on other platforms so we become relevant in the eyes of Google? So that's off-page SEO. So SEO is always going to be two-pronged. What you do on your website and what you do off the website to make sure your website, your domain, whatever that domain is, .com or .org, is relevant in the eyes of Google. And so let's take a look at on-page SEO first. So like I mentioned, it involves optimizing your website. And when we say optimizing your website, there's a lot of things you can do on your website to make it relevant in the eyes of Google. And we can look at the content, okay? We can look at the source code. And so there are a lot of different components to be looked at here. So you have the header tag, you have the meta description, you have the alt tag, you have how fast your page loads, you have internal linking, you have a site map, you have a lots of different things going on here. And so for me, one of the first things you should do when you create a page on your website is to make sure the title tag is unique and includes those keywords. So if we look here at this example, the title tag is important because that's what shows up in search results. Here you can see the title tag on Google is up to 65 characters. So you always want to include that keyword in the title tag. Then you have your URL and then you have what you call a meta description. So that's underneath the URL, underneath the title tag. And again, this is in search results. So organic search results, somebody types in a keyword, you want to be found and you want your title tag to stick out and you want your meta description to specifically describe what it is you're offering. Okay, so again, if somebody's looking for stock imagery, then you wanna make sure that you know that person who's looking for stock imagery can come to your website and they can, in this case, search for millions of royalty free stock images, photos, videos, and music. And so you want your description to really get that person to click on your listing, an organic search. That's the whole point. So that's the point of a title tag and a meta description is you really want to be found for what somebody's searching for and you want to be able to show them that you have what they're looking for. You have something here underneath your organic search results called site links. And site links are just other or links to pages on your website. And so Unfortunately, this is not necessarily in your control. This is in the control of Google. So if Google wants to offer up site links underneath your title tag and meta description, they will add them. And it's based really on the amount of content you have. And that goes with site search. So you can see also there's site search there underneath the meta description. All of that is contingent upon your website. Do you have a lot of content? And if you have a lot of relevant content, then Google will naturally add in site links underneath your organic listing to links to other pages on your site. So that's on-page SEO. And now we're going to look at off-page SEO. Okay, so off-page SEO involves using promotional methods beyond just optimizing your site. For example, optimizing your title tag and meta description might not be enough to get you to rank for that coveted keyword query. So we need to do some link building. We need to get our name out there on other websites. Okay, so we need to be able to establish some external links or backlinks from high quality relevant sites to our site. And it may not just necessarily have to be a link because Google recognizes linkless backlinks. So just having a reference on a high quality site may be good enough to get you in the eyes of Google to become more relevant. Okay, so that's off-page SEO in definition. So really what we want to do is we want to establish a way to get links from other websites to our own or references on other websites to our website. We want to build those links to help us gain in ranking. So there's lots of ways to do that. You have social media. Again, you have social content sites like Reddit, Medium, Quora. You have blogging. Okay, there's lots of ways to establish yourself 
out there on the internet. You just need to make sure they're quality sites and you need to make sure they're relevant. And so when you do get a link on an external site pointing back to yours, you want to make sure it's a follow. So you want to make sure that Google knows to follow that link from that site to yours. So if you're out there establishing content on a third party website or another website and they're going to link back to you, just make sure that it's a follow. Do follow, not a no follow. Okay. And I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like here. So if you're not sure what the difference is, here I'm on backlinko.com and really a no follow versus a do follow is simply in the href. So in the href, if you don't have anything in there other than the link, then the search engines are going to follow that link from that external site to yours. And if you have a no follow in that link, then the search engines are going to ignore the link. So you're not going to pick up the backlink or external link to your site. And that's simply that site just adding the REL equals no follow. Okay. So if you see that in the link pointing to your site from that external site, then that means you're not going to get credit for that backlink. So you always want to shoot for a do follow link because that means you're going to get credit for the backlink. Okay. So again, do follow links allow search engine crawlers to follow the link. And if they can follow it, you're going to get what they call link juice. And that's going to establish some reputation to your domain. A no follow link basically doesn't allow the search engines to follow that link. So it doesn't pass on the link juice. Now, again, search engines like Google are smart enough to pick up the association between a website that talks about your website and your website. So meaning if you don't have a link and you don't have a, if you have a no follow link on that site, don't fret because you know, Google has come a long way. They're not necessarily focused on links, though it does help. So for example, if you are on a very prominent site and there's no link, then you still may get credit because Google does recognize linkless backlinks. And that's what they call a linkless backlink is just having a reference on that site. But you always want to try and get that follow, not the do not follow. Okay, so here you can see an example of off-page SEO. Okay, like TripAdvisor would be a good example. A link that redirects from TripAdvisor to, you know, the Oprah Magazine as an example. So the Oprah Magazine is going to get a, a back link from TripAdvisor to the site. So if Google crawls TripAdvisor, then they're going to be able to see this link. And if it's a follow link, they're going to give the Oprah magazine that domain credit from TripAdvisor. So for SEO, because there's a two pronged approach involved, you have on page and off page There's a lot of tools here, a lot of tools. So let's take a look at some of these tools. We're going to look at Google Keyword Planner. We're going to look at Moz, Ahrefs, look at some tools that will help you with both on page and off page SEO. So let's start with Google's Keyword Planner. So why are we using Google's Keyword Planner? Because we want to find keywords. Okay, so we can't do on-page SEO. We can't optimize our title tag and meta description without a good keyword that we want to be found for. So what we want to do is we want to go into Google Ads. Now that's a pay-per-click platform. Okay, so if you want to be found via paid search, you're going to use Google Ads. But from an organic search perspective, we can use Google's Keyword Planner. So we need a Google Ads account we have a Google ads account, then all we need to do is go to tools. Then we need to go to keyword planner and the keyword planner is a good tool because it allows us to find those coveted keywords. So we can discover new keywords and that's exactly what we're going to do. So for example, we're going to find, you know, use the keyword mail delivery. If we have a, a business that delivers mails to people, what keywords do we want to optimize for? So we're going to be in Google ads. We're going to go to, go to tools. We're going to go to keyword planner. We're going to discover new keywords and we're simply just going to type in a keyword. So we're going to click get results and Google's keyword planner is basically going to give us some information. So the keyword we chose was mail delivery. 
And they're telling us that on average over the last 12 months, there's 22,200 search queries on average over the last 12 months. Okay, so I could see if I click hover over the graph here, I'm gonna be able to see the average over 12 months. Okay, so here I could see the average over 12 months from July to June 2019. So here, what do I wanna do? I wanna look for trends. Because you, here I could see the averages go up and down a little bit, but 22,200 is the average over 12 months. And then Google's Keyword Planner also tells me how competitive that keyword is. So if it's highly competitive, but it's got a lot of search volume, it could be a keyword I may wanna covet. But the beauty of the Keyword Planner is that they also give you other keywords to look at. Okay, so mail delivery service is 49,500. Okay, so here you got some other ones. Best food delivery service, 9,900. Again, some of these are very competitive, but some of them aren't. And so you wanna be able to do your due diligence, do some analysis and figure out what keywords work best for you that aren't gonna be competitive, but at the same time, give you some search volume. So if you do rank for that keyword, you should expect X amount of clicks on that keyword based on the volume. So that's Google's Keyword Planner. Alternatively, you can use a tool like Moz.com. So if I log into Moz, we have a tool called Keyword Explorer. And so here I can just type in that same keyword, mail delivery, targeting the United States in English, and Moz is going to give me some information on the keyword. So here, they're gonna give me a range in terms of the monthly volume, and they're gonna give me a difficulty score. So they're gonna tell me how difficult this keyword is. So out of a score of 100, it's 53, and they're gonna tell me what my expected click-through rate could be if I'm ranking for that keyword. More importantly, they're going to give me some other keyword suggestions, just like Google's Keyword Planner. So here, I can see prepared mail delivery, mail delivery service, mail delivery companies. So there are a lot of different suggestions of keywords that I can choose from. And if we scroll down, we could see basically some mentions. We could see the analysis, who's ranking for these keywords. So we can really get some insight as to who's ranking, how much volume, how difficult it is, what my estimates could be if I'm ranking, etc. So a lot of information built into Moz's Keyword Explorer tool. So Moz's Keyword Explorer tool could be a good option for you if you don't have access to Google Ads and Google's Keyword Planner. So if you're working on SEO for a website and you're curious is about what the off-page SEO situation looks like, well, you can use a tool like Ahrefs. It's a free tool. You can go here, and if you're working on a specific domain and you're focused on off-page, you could simply type in that domain here and then you could check the backlinks for that domain. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and type in my, my domain, and now I'm gonna get a sense of what my backlink profile is for my domain. So here I can see the number of backlinks, the total backlinks, and notice 85% of them are do follow links. So Google is able to recognize those links. And then I could see referring domains. So I have 124 different domains pointing to my website. And so here I can get a snapshot of the top 100 backlinks pointing to my website. And so this just gives me a snapshot of what's going on with my off-page SEO performance. Again, it's a free tool. It's good to use because it gives you an idea of what your off-page SEO situation looks like. Okay, another tool you could use is Pingdom. Okay, you can set up a free trial here. It's good for 14 days and it allows you to, you know, look at page speed. It allows you to monitor the site itself in terms of, you know, visitors, maintenance, etc. So you can use Pingdom as well. Uh, however, it's only a 14 day free trial, but it does give you some good insights into SEO.
Now, page load time is one of those on-page SEO factors. And so if you're doing on-page SEO for domain, you certainly wanna go into Google Analytics and you wanna measure the page load performance of the pages on your website. And so here, if I go to Google Analytics and then I go to behavior and I go to site speed and I go to speed suggestions, here I can see the pages, how many pages I've received over a period of time and then the average page load time. Now, if you see the average page load time is slow and in my opinion, anything over two to three seconds is going to be slow, you need to be able to take action. And so the great thing about Google Analytics, the page load time reporting, is it actually gives you some suggestions. So page speed suggestions. So all you need to do is click on the link here. In this case, this particular link or URL on my website has seven suggestions. If I click on that, then page speed insights is gonna open up. And what's gonna happen is Google Analytics slash page speed insights is gonna analyze this page and give me some feedback on how the page is performing, not only on desktop, but on mobile as well. And so here I can see, if I analyze this page, I can see some of the opportunities to improve the page load time on desktop and again on mobile here. So here you can see a lot of the opportunities and a lot of the issues I have that I can address. Now, if you're going to manage SEO for a website, then you're going to need an SEO platform. So again, Moz is a good example because we showed you the keyword explorer, but they also have many other tools available built right into the platform. For example, rankings, okay? You can get crawl information. So when the bots crawl the site, or what kind of errors are coming up? Here I can get some page optimization so I can choose a keyword and I could choose a page and Moz is going to be able to give me feedback to see what more I could do to improve my on-page SEO performance. Okay, we mentioned Keyword Explorer in terms of looking for keywords. Okay, you also have something called Link Explorer as well. So if I go back and choose Link Explorer from my list here, then I'm gonna go to a Link Explorer and I can type in any domain. Again, just like on the Ahrefs, Except Moz goes a little bit deeper here. Okay, so they're telling me how many linking domains and what my keywords are ranking. Okay, and then I have some other reports that I can leverage for off page SEO. I can look at spam scores for certain websites that are linking to me because you can disavow yourself from being associated with those sites. Here you got a link intersect tool so you can compare one domain against another to what links are pointing to that other website. So a lot of different reports and tools available to you for off-page SEO under Moz's Link Explorer. So Moz has a lot of different tools available. And again, my recommendation, if you don't use Moz, there's SEMrush, there's Bright Edge, there's a lot of SEO platforms out there to use, but if you're gonna focus on SEO, you are going to need an SEO platform. Now, if you have any more questions on SEO, you know, feel free to go to Simply Learn's YouTube account. You'll be able to find a video there for SEO tutorial for beginners. You know, take a look at the video. It goes really in depth about everything we just covered about on-page and off-page SEO. So take a look at the video. And if you have any comments about everything we covered with SEO, feel free to comment underneath this video here and we'll be sure to respond accordingly, uh, especially if you have any tips and tricks that you do for SEO. So let's move from search engine optimization to content marketing. And so content marketing is a form of marketing that involves simulating interest in a brand's products or services by creating and sharing online material. So when we talk about online material that can come in many forms or assets. So some examples are blogs, videos, infographics, case studies, white papers, eBooks. All of this is content generated. It's just in different forms. And so you wanna be able to take any one of these forms of content and be able to distribute that in some form or fashion, okay? So for example, a blog can be part of your website. 
a video could be something you upload to YouTube. An infographic could be something you actually share on LinkedIn. So all these other assets could be integrated throughout. They could be shared or used on your website, okay? For people to grab and share and use and comment on, okay? So that's what content marketing is. You need to be able to push out content so that people have a better understanding of your product or service. The process of content marketing is you really wanna decide what goal you want to achieve with your content marketing campaign. You want to define your buyer personas to determine the audience best suited for your content. Okay, so what are you creating? Who is it for? And then you want to run content audits to determine the best type of content that can be used. And when we talk about content audits, we're talking about, you know, content that's already been posted. Are people sharing it? Are people downloading? Are people viewing it? And so you wanna be able to understand over time what people are reacting to so that you can reuse or continue to use that content that seems to resonate with your target audience. So you wanna choose an appropriate content management system. So if it's a blog, you wanna use WordPress maybe. So you wanna start brainstorming for ideas, for new content ideas. So in my opinion, maybe put together a content calendar and jot some ideas on that content calendar. Then you wanna settle on a particular type of content you wanna create, and then you wanna be able to publish and manage your content. So some top popular tools used for content marketing, you, know, you have Buffer, you have BuzzSumo, FollowerOne, Hootsuite. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of a content marketing management system. And we're gonna use WordPress. And so if we go into WordPress here, on the back end, we're logging a login. And so the reason why we use WordPress is because we can post blogs. So in WordPress, if I go to post here, I'm gonna be able to see all the different posts that have been posted over a period of time. And the great thing about WordPress is you can optimize it for SEO. So if I go in here and look at this recent blog post that has been posted, I can go ahead and edit it. And when I edit it, okay, I'm gonna be able to look at this blog post in a visual format, and I can also look at it in HTML form. So notice, I the great thing about WordPress is I can use imagery, I can insert videos, I can insert infographics, I can attach a white paper case study to it. And then again, we have something called Yoast SEO plugin. So we've installed a plugin here, so that'll help us with optimizing that particular blog post for that particular keyword we're trying to target. And so here you can see our focus keyword is remarketing and retargeting. Okay, so we have that in the title tag. Okay, and we also wanna make sure it's in the meta description. And so here we have an internal link. We have it in the introduction. Okay, we have it you know, spread throughout the content. So Yoast does a good job of allowing us to make sure we're integrating that keyword into our blog post. But the key to blog posting is we wanna again follow the process. We wanna be able to choose content for our intended audience. And in this case with a blog post, we can write up to, you know, 500 to 3000 keywords. And the whole point is we're trying to introduce our audience to a particular topic that resonates with our product or service. And so that's the great thing about blogging. That's the great thing about WordPress is that, you know, very easy to use. Uh, you can integrate it with SEO. You obviously have commenting, you have different plugins that you can add in there, uh, very easy to edit. And so there's a lot you can do here with WordPress and blogging. So another example of content marketing is video. So with video, you have the ability to upload this video to popular video sites like YouTube or Video, and you can optimize that particular video with title tags and, and hashtags and descriptions. And you could see the interaction here. So you can see how many views, how many likes, 
shares, the ability to share, the ability of people for saving it. And there's just a lot of interactivity when you have video. You can also use video, as I mentioned, on your blogging platform. If it's WordPress, you can also use video in social media platforms like Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So video is a very popular form of content marketing. Lots of good video tools out there to create a video. A high quality video is what you want to put your product and service in the best forefront. Okay, so that people can react, they can share, they can comment, they can follow, they can like. Okay, so that's what you want to do is think about video because video is very versatile and powerful in terms of getting your message out there. So let's move from content marketing to social media marketing. And social media marketing really involves creating content, if it's that blog, if it's that video that you created for content marketing, and really using different platforms to increase your visibility. Whether that be traffic, whether it be engagement, whether it be brand awareness, or any other marketing goals that you have. That's what social media is good for because social media will take that content, take what you're trying to get out there, and really allow you to hone your marketing goals against that. Okay, so if it's Facebook and you got some videos that you want to post up there, okay, what's your goal? Is your goal to then post the video to get traffic to your website or to build brand awareness or to just get people to react by sharing or liking? And so that's what social media is good for. It's really good for taking content and really distributing it to your target audience. Okay, so uh, sharing content allows you to, you know, generate user generated content or it allows you to create interactive content. And again, you can use infographics or you can apply content with imagery or post videos or do things that are interactive like polling and contests. So a lot of flexibility in terms of the content that you could share on social media. And so you wanna establish a process for social media marketing. So this is the digital marketing course of it. So you wanna be able to have a process and you wanna be able to set up goals that you want to achieve with your social media campaign because just posting content for content sake is really not gonna generate anything for you. So you wanna set up those goals ahead of time. Then you wanna understand what content would be best suited for your target audience. So if our goal is to generate brand awareness, then maybe an infographic is what we want to do, okay? Maybe that's the best choice of asset for our target audience based on the platform. With social media, we also want to research what the competition is and find out what works for them. So it's very easy to do on social. So if you already have a competitor on Facebook, you can always go to your competitor's website and you can always see you know, what they're posting and what kind of reaction engagement they're getting for a particular post. So it doesn't help before you go live to do some due diligence about your competition. You can also conduct a social media audit. And again, what we mean by audit, just like on the content side, we want to be able to see what's worked and what's not worked in the past. And with digital marketing, recall, you can get instant metrics back. So if you posted something last year, and you're thinking about posting it again, you probably want to do an audit to see over the past year what posts have worked and have not worked for you. Then you want to pick and choose the social media channels or platforms and to find a strategy for each of them. Because if you have a video, then the video may work on, say, YouTube or Instagram, but may not necessarily work for LinkedIn and Twitter. And so you want to be able to pick and choose the asset, the strategy, and align it with the appropriate platform. Then you want to take inspiration from case studies and other famous brands. So again, continue to learn. I mean, that's the beauty of social media marketing. Most big companies, medium-sized companies, even smaller companies that have performed well are out on social media. So take a look at some other companies that inspire you or some other companies in your industry or even, again, your competitors and see what they're doing and what they're posting and what kind of engagement they're getting. So you should always you know, be able to seek out what others are doing on social. And to me, this is important. Create a social media content calendar and 
this isn't necessarily the very end of the process. This goes back to the beginning of the process. So when you are establishing goals and you're establishing what kind of type of content you want to use, that should all be part of a social media content calendar. And I'm going to show you an example of one here shortly. And then again, you want to be able to test, evaluate, and adjust your strategy because again, you're getting metrics. And if you post a video on Facebook and it's taking off, then meaning in terms of likes and shares, you probably want to consider maybe doing another one that complements that. So here's a broad example of a content calendar. Again, it's in a spreadsheet. Again, by no means does one size fits all, but just to give you an idea, if we're blogging, what we want to do is we want to pick our target audience. Maybe that'd be country or particular demographic. And you want to come up with some topics ahead of time here and you want to maybe put the status up there of you know it's just a draft or an idea or when it actually does go live you want to turn it on live you want to pick your date add some comments okay create your content and you know what's good about a content calendar is you can also work in seo so you can assign keywords and then you could add those keywords to moz for ranking uh, you can create your title and meta description. Then you can carry that content forward and choose a particular social media platform to post to. So that's the beauty of a social, or excuse me, a content calendar is it allows you to think about things up front and then prepare the content accordingly so you can optimize it for organic search and post it on social media for off-page SEO and for social media marketing. And so you just want to get organized ahead of time using a spreadsheet, in this case, Google Sheets, to lay out the topics ahead of time so you can write the content for your intended audience. That, to me, is the way to go. Now, remember, there's lots of different forms of content that you can use with social media marketing. Here we have video. So you can see this video could be posted on YouTube or LinkedIn or wherever. And the whole point is you want to be able to measure engagement. Here you can see this is just an image, it's just a file, and this has been posted on Facebook. So here we can see how many likes and comments and then shares. And so you want to be able to leverage different forms and different assets across social media to see actually what works and what doesn't work. And again, look at what other companies have done, whether they be competitors or not, see what type of assets they're posting and what's working for them. Now, when it comes to social media marketing, there are lots of tools available. Okay, you got Buffer, Hootsuite, Sprinkler, Post Planner, Later, Sprout Social. I mean, the list of social media marketing tools is endless. And just like SEO, you will need a platform to work with. So with SEO, we showed you Moz as the SEO platform. With Social, we're gonna show you Sprout Social because with Sprout Social, if you have a content calendar, if you have a lot of different assets, you want to be able to organize those assets and content across multiple channels. And the great thing about using a social media calendar is yes, you can publish and organize your post accordingly. You also have most social media platform tools have listening. So you can listen in on keywords and audiences, different brands and industries and conversations that are being had about a specific topic. Okay, and again, most social media platforms, if not all, have reporting. And so this is important because you can actually see, you know, what how your post or different assets are performing in terms of engagement. And so to me, that's important. If you're going to focus on social media as a platform, as, as a channel, you want to have a social media platform tool that will help you organize your content, publish it accordingly, listen in, and, and get that report to help you figure out what's engaging and what's not engaging. Again, so that you can you know, react to the content that you're using and sharing. So that's Sprout Social is an example, but you will need a social media platform. Now, the other benefit to social media is in some cases you could actually pay to have your post out there. And so, for example, on Facebook, we could set up a paid campaign to target our intended audience. And so with Facebook, 
Facebook owns Instagram. So you have the ability to really put your content out in front of your target audience on Facebook and Instagram. And so what you need to do is go to Facebook ads manager and simply just create an account or campaign. Um, you want to be able to create a campaign and by creating a campaign, that means you're going to have to go through a particular process here. So if we first we want to do is choose our objective. Okay. So you always want to have an objective for your campaign. So is it going to be brand awareness? Is it going to be to drive, you know, traffic? Is it going to be to drive conversions? So you want to choose a goal or objective if you're advertising really on any platform. Then you want to be able to choose your audience. So who are we trying to target? So with Facebook, you know, you can target any specific age, gender, demographic based on interest and behavior. So you can choose specific placements and you can assign a budget. Okay. And then on the ad side, you have different types of ads that you can use. You can do a single image or video. You can do a carousel. Okay. Meaning you can rotate different images uh, as a collage or different videos as a collage. And again, you can choose exactly where you want your ad to be shown. For example, desktop or mobile newsfeed, Facebook and stream video. You got Instagram feed. You got even messenger. So you have a lot of options available to you on where your ad or video is going to be shown. And then you could support that with a headline description and you can send that traffic back to your website. You can even test call to action buttons. Okay. So you can pen your ad with a call to action button. And so you can do a lot here. This is just Facebook. You can really do a lot of specific targeting. Now with Facebook advertising, it's a cost per click model. So anytime somebody does click on that ad, you're going to pay, but it allows you to really get your content out there in front of your intended audience. If you're not doing it organically, meaning you're not posting on Facebook on a regular basis, or maybe you want to supplement those organic posts, then doing this is a good way to really get your brand out there. If it's awareness, if it's to drive traffic or to convert, Facebook is a good option. LinkedIn, Twitter, all these social media platforms offer that up, that option up to do paid advertising. Now, if you want more information about social media, we have a great video on YouTube already, how to start social media marketing. It really goes into the details about organic social and what I just covered with paid social, specifically on Facebook. So take a look at that video. And again, if I missed anything on the social media side, feel free to comment or add in your best practice, whether that be part of the process or a different platform that you use for social media. Okay, let's switch to our next digital marketing channel and search engine marketing. So search engine marketing is an advertising model that is good for driving traffic to your site because you're paying each time someone clicks on your advertisement. Now, how is that an equal trade? Well, because you can advertise on channels like or search engines like Google or Bing or AdRoll, which has a a big network that includes Google, you can actually pay your way to the top of search engine rankings. And so if you're at the top for paid search and somebody searches something like uh, shoes or something to that effect, your ad can appear at the very top, even above local search, even above organic search. And so the visibility is there. It's a good way for you to then get that traffic that, uh, that you, you know, covet for certain keywords. And because you're getting traffic or have the potential to get traffic, you're gonna pay each time somebody clicks on these ads. So you have multiple choices on the type of asset you wanna use, including text, image, video, etc. So there's more to it than just Google, Bing, AdRoll. I mean, you have LinkedIn, you have Twitter, you have Facebook. So you have lots of different ways to advertise and get your ad in a more prominent position. You just have to pay for it. And I just showed you that under social media marketing, Facebook, you can create an ad, have your ad targeting your audience, and in return, you're going to pay Facebook. Works the same way 
for most of these networks. Okay, so when you actually set up a campaign, like anything you do when you set up a campaign, you want to determine the goal you want to achieve for the campaign. You want to do that up front, especially when you're talking about paying per click. If you're paying per click, then you definitely want to make sure you determine what your goals are so you can measure them accordingly. Then you want to choose, in this case, a relevant list of keywords. You could do it for your brand, meaning you could choose your own brand keywords. You could choose keywords related to what your brand is trying to offer, whether that be a service or product. And once you choose a relevant list of keywords, you can finalize those keywords and then bid on them. So once you start bidding on them, then what you're going to do is align those keywords with a headline. So it's all done within the framework of any platform you're advertising on. Really the key here that I want to really emphasize is when you establish a campaign or set up a campaign, you need to establish what the goal is. Because when you actually choose your keywords and write your ads and launch the campaign and start paying Google or Bing or whomever it is you're advertising with, you want to be able to measure those goals. So that's really the important part here. Because regardless of where you advertise, you're going to be able to monitor campaign results. And so with Google, you can even import conversions into the campaign. So for example, if I go to Google ads, for example, if I go to tools, okay, you can see I'm running campaigns. What am I trying to accomplish with these campaigns? Well, in this case, I'm trying to get donations. People click on donations. So I can go to tools, click conversions, and then I can see what conversions are added to my account. And that way I can measure my campaigns against these conversions. Okay, if I don't see a conversion error, I can certainly create one or import it from, in this case, Google Analytics. So that's the important thing. You want to be able to measure your campaigns with your conversions. And then just as important, you want to be able to optimize your campaign. Because if it's not performing, if you're running a campaign, you're running up costs and you're not getting conversions, you're probably not going to be continuing to run those campaigns. So you want to optimize your campaign and retarget potential customers. So retargeting is always a good option. Retargeting is targeting someone who that went to your website and basically acted in a certain way, meaning they went to a certain page or abandoned a card or actually purchased or downloaded something okay you define what action you want that audience to take in order to retarget to them okay so the whole point is you can configure your retargeting campaign based on certain behavior on your website and the whole point there of retargeting is you're pulling people back to your website so in addition to optimizing you know search campaigns you can one of the benefits of search engine marketing is you can run retargeting campaigns so here's an example of an ad okay so here you could see it's a good ad in the sense that it's using everything available to it so for example here i could see three headlines so google in this example allows you to add in three headlines so here you could see simply learn official site get certified get ahead and then you can see simply learn.com so they're taking advantage of three headlines and then here you can see two description lines and so each description line you can have up to 90 characters and so you want to be able to take advantage of what google gives you the more information you can add the better well here you can see some other types of ads here you can see a banner ad for slack okay here you can see betterment.com running an ad okay so this looks like an ad that is on youtube so because you can see after a few seconds you can skip the ad okay so here's a video ad Here's an image ad, here's a text ad. So depending on what platform you advertise on, you have an, an option on what type of asset you want to use. You know, the one thing I like about Facebook is they offer up a multitude of options in terms of assets. So you can run a single image ad, you can run a carousel, meaning you got a multiple images, you can run a video, you can run a combination video image, you could obviously run text, okay, with a thumbnail. So you have a lot of options in terms of the type of ad you can run. So before we move into our next channel, let me just show you an example of you know how an ad actually looks on a particular website so here you can see i'm on buzzfeednews.com okay here you can see 
Uh, Volkswagen Golf is running an advertisement in Spanish on this particular site. So they're either using Google or some other platform and having that platform, if it's Google, post their ad on this particular site. So here you can see it's a banner ad. And if we're in Google ads and you're setting up a text ad, let me just run through you what that text that looks like. Remember, you want to always take advantage of what's offered to you because especially text ads, you have very few characters and with very few characters, it's hard to get your message across. So with Google, you have your final URL, which is where people are going to go to after they click on your ad, but you have one, not one, not two, but three headlines that you can take advantage of. So if we're talking about help end child hunger, help today. You know, you can always add in, visit our website for more info. I mean, you want to take advantage of what's available to you. Now, again, here you can see in this example, I am only allotted 30 characters. And so if you go over, then your ad's not going to get approved. So you really have to be cognizant of the character counts and getting your point across because writing text ads is not the easiest thing to do when you're limited to characters. Now with Google, you have what they call display path. So after the domain, you can add in a couple of keywords in there and then you have description line one and description line two. So again, take advantage of what's available. If you're not sure what copy to write, grab some from the website and paste it in there. You want your ads to be healthy and to have as much information as possible. And then the one thing I will say about Google ads is they also have extensions. So extensions are exactly that. They're extensions to your text ad. So here you can see I have four extensions. These are actually site links. So Google ads offers up something called ad extensions. So it could be call outs, site links, it could be location extensions, app extensions. They have a number of different extensions that they can append to your ad. So take advantage of that as well. Remember the whole point of ads is to make a compelling case for your product or service so that somebody can click on the ad and go to your website and then perform the action you want them to perform. Now, if you have any more questions about Google ads, feel free to check out our in-depth video about Google ads. It covers everything A to Z on Google ads. You know, we also have videos on our Simply Learn YouTube playlist for Facebook, uh, Twitter, social media marketing. So if you're curious to know a little bit more about search engine marketing, you know, check out any one of these videos that we have listed on our YouTube channel. Okay, so let's move over to affiliate marketing now. And so with affiliate marketing, really it's interesting and unique in that affiliate marketing involves paying out commissions. And who are you paying commissions to? Well, you're paying commissions to website owners or publishers or people who have websites with lots of content or people who have websites that attract a lot of users. And so the whole point is you wanna be able to find those websites to advertise your product or service, okay? These people who are selling your product or service on your behalf are gonna get commissioned or incentivized based on whatever action you put out there. So it could be registrations, just getting your affiliates to help you with getting people registered or signing up for your email or you know, for a lot of you conversions, you're trying to sell a product, so you want help in selling that product. Or it could be subscriptions, okay, signing up to something. Okay, so you determine what it is you want to incentivize your affiliates for. You also determine how much you're going to incentivize them. And that's the great thing about affiliate marketing. It's, it's no different than having a sales team um, to support you. What are the stats for affiliate marketing? Well, you need to find a platform. There are lots of different affiliate platforms out there. You know, Commission Junction or CJ.com comes to mind because these platforms are going to help you find these affiliates or partners. Okay, so they're the broker and all this. And so once you set up your platform, you're going to establish rules, guidelines, post images and banners and assets for those affiliates to use on their websites. And more importantly, again, you're gonna establish the commission. So the commission doesn't have to be the same for all affiliates. It could simply be 
you know, your top affiliates get a higher commission as opposed to just some other affiliates who get a starting commission. You establish everything on the platform, the affiliate platform that you choose. Now, affiliates apply to advertise on your behalf. So they're gonna say, hey, I'm interested in selling your product or service. So you're gonna use that platform, if it's Commission Junction, to approve or disapprove the re affiliate's request to advertise on your behalf. And really what you wanna try and do is leverage the platform as best as you can. A lot of these affiliates are out to make money and some of them are really good. You need to be able to choose the affiliate that is going to represent your brand, product, or service the best. So it's simple. Customer clicks on an ad or link okay, on that affiliate website and they go to your website and they perform an action. So that could be a purchase, a registration, a subscription, a download, an email sign up. You determine that. And the great thing is these Affiliate networks, the CJs, Commission Junctions of the world will record everything. They're tracking not only traffic from the affiliate website to your website, but they're also tracking the conversions. The transaction is validated and credited to the affiliate by the broker. And then the affiliate is paid his or her commission. So that's how it works. So the more the affiliate sells or converts on your behalf, the more they're going to make. And that's the beauty of the affiliate network. So here's an example of affiliate marketing. Okay, here you could see uh, an advertisement here. Okay, so you could see profit from our experience. Earn up to 12% advertising fees with a trusted e-commerce list leader. So somebody clicks on that link, joins, and then this person is going to get a commission based on somebody joining for free. Again, I mentioned Commission Junction. There are also some other affiliate marketing tools out there. Uh, Amazon Associates, AWIN, Trade Doubler, Max Bounty. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a lot out there. CJ.com is the one I've used in the past, but you know, give some of these other platforms a chance. Okay, it doesn't hurt to even be on multiple platforms. You have nothing to lose. Okay, when you're on a platform, basically the platform again is acting as the middle person. They're introducing you to affiliates. And so every time you actually pay an affiliate a commission, they're gonna get their cut of it. So they're gonna get a small percentage as well. So just keep that in mind, but you know, give it a try. Try one or two of these affiliates. If you find you're getting quality affiliates that are selling your product or service, great. If you don't, then you know, feel free to change you know, affiliate networks. It's that simple. But the key here is find the affiliates you think are going to best represent your brand, product, or service because those affiliates are likely going to be the ones to convert for you. And if you're a small business starting out and you need some help, affiliate marketing is the way to go. Okay, let's move over to native advertising. Okay, so native advertising. So native advertisements means that your ad is showing up next to content that basically naturally fits. So these are advertisements that are featured on a platform alongside the content, okay, that isn't paid for. Okay, so for example, here you can see a paid post. Okay, this is by Spotify. Okay, this paid post, okay, was on BuzzFeed. This particular post was probably on a news article related to music because they're talking about you know, bands that probably wouldn't exist without Led Zeppelin. Okay, so for Spotify, you using native advertising allows them to put their ad next to content related to their ad. Here you can see another BuzzFeed article. Okay, 11 great Amazon deals that will be music to your ears if you're an audiophile. Here you can see an advertisement next to the article. So you can see the ad about Led Zeppelin, and here you can see the actual article is about music. So the whole point about native advertising is making sure there's a connection between the ad and the article. So Spotify is advertising okay, their product and service on an article on BuzzFeed, which happens to be about music. So a good example, we used BuzzFeed just a second ago. So if we go to BuzzFeed, here you can see I'm on TV and movies, and here you can see, got an ad here. If we scroll down, uh, keep scrolling down, we could see another ad here for HBO. And so this ad makes sense because it's placed on TVs and movies. So people who go and read the content 
are gonna see an ad related to that content. So that's generally what native advertising is. You need to be able to be able to place the ad on the right pages. Okay, so you're gonna need an ad network for that. So we talked about paid search advertising, we talked about Google Ads. So Google Ads has the ability to place your ad natively on particular pages that are relevant to that ad. So that's really what native advertising is all about, making sure that your ad is placed next to content that's naturally relevant. So if you need more information about affiliate marketing, feel free to visit Simply Learn's YouTube channel. We have a nice uh, in-depth video about affiliate marketing to get more information about the platforms, how it works, and all the tips and best practices about how to run a successful affiliate marketing campaign. So let's turn our attention to email marketing now. So email marketing, very traditional form of digital marketing. It's been around the longest. It's kind of the grandfather of all digital marketing channels. So email marketing really is used to personalize emails in order to convert that recipient or that prospective user into a customer. And so like all the other digital marketing channels, we wanna follow some type of flow or process or methodology. And the first step in email marketing is you have to identify your target audience. Okay, when you identify your target audience, you're gonna create a segment. Okay, so in other words, you don't wanna send one email to everyone because not everyone is gonna be interested in that email. So in order to get somebody interested, you need to be able to send an email tailored to that audience. Okay, so that audience can respond and react accordingly. So once you target that audience and create segments, email segments, you're gonna create the campaign and set up an appropriate call to action. One note here is when you create the campaign and set up that appropriate call to action, that call to action is gonna be aligned with your goal. So what is the goal of the email campaign? Is it simply to get people to click on something and purchase? Or is it simply to get people to click on something and sign up or watch something or submit some information or download or whatever the case? You need to establish that up front just like you would with a search engine marketing campaign or any other type of campaign you wanna run. So there are lots of tools out there, just like with affiliate marketing, you wanna choose an appropriate email marketing tool. There are plenty to be had, each work in a very similar nature. Some offer different pricing models, meaning you, know, you can send an email to X recipients for a flat fee or you pay a small amount per email address. Each one is slightly different in terms of how they price, but in terms of the features, they all work in a very similar fashion. And we're gonna show you an example of one here shortly. So when you choose that email marketing tool, you're gonna test your emails before you send them out. And then when you test your emails, you're gonna use that email marketing tool to actually send the campaign after it's been tested. Okay, so you wanna send the campaign, you can immediately send them out or you can schedule them. Now. A best practice with an email is when you actually send one out, you're sending an email out to your target audience, you wanna create probably two emails per segment audience. Why? Because you wanna add an attractive subject line and copy to the email, but if you send two emails to the same target audience, then you wanna test the subject lines. You wanna be able to see what subject line is going to entice somebody to open the email. Okay, that's the beauty of email marketing is you can do that. Okay, so you can set up your a design based on your target audience, but it's always the subject line that people see first. So you want to write an attractive subject line and copy that's going to entice somebody to open the email. So why not send two emails to each target audience? That way you can see what email subject line works best. So that's the whole idea about performing A, B tests to test out different ideas. It doesn't necessarily have to be a subject line. It can be the same subject line, two emails, but the difference being the body of the email. It's totally up to you, but the idea here is to always split out your emails per target audience. And just like any other channel, whether it be affiliate or search engine marketing or organic search, you wanna analyze performance. 
And in the case of emails, it's always about open rates. How many people are opening? Then how many people are clicking? And then how many people are actually responding? Are they converting or downloading or whatever it is you want them to do? You need to be able to monitor the behavior because, for example, if your open rates don't work or they're low, then you know something's wrong with your subject line. So you want to be able to make an adjustment. So here's an example of an email from Airbnb. It's a simple email, okay? They're just simply trying to get somebody to click on that call to action to take the survey. Okay, that's really all it's about here with this particular email. So who is their target audience? Well, their target audience could be somebody who's already stayed at a Airbnb property, or it could be somebody who used the app. Probably Airbnb has already targeted this audience and they're sending this survey to a particular audience so that they can get the best results. Okay, so that's a good example of a targeted email with a good call to action that's getting somebody to take the survey. So they're probably measuring how many people opened it, how many people clicked on the CTA, the call to action, and then how many people actually filled out the survey. So you need to follow each step and track each step accordingly. Okay, so again, some popular tools used in email marketing let's take a look at mailchimp here uh but i will mention like marketo is a good marketing automation tool now owned by adobe marketo allows you to send those drip campaigns so if somebody doesn't purchase right away you can send up follow-up emails like say one day out or seven days out or 14 days out so hubspot works in a very similar fashion you want to be able to methodically plan out your emails. That's the point I'm trying to make here. So let's take a look at MailChimp. So if we go over into MailChimp, a very easy interface. Okay, here we go under audience. We can actually see who our audience is. And we can break out our audience into different groups. You can have a simple test list. You can have people who purchase, people who subscribe to something. Okay, so you can break out your audience into different groups. Okay, when it comes to campaigns, you can see campaigns that are already been built or you can create your own campaign. Okay, so in the case of MailChimp, we can actually see what campaigns have been dropped or sent out already. And then we could see the opens, the clicks, and then the conversions. So MailChimp has some nice reporting. So you want to be able to measure the reports or how well the campaign performed. So here we can see specifically how many people opened, clicked, how many people bounced or email addresses bounced, and how many people unsubscribed from the list. And here we can see, you know, the top links that have been clicked, okay, the subscribers with the most opens. Did anybody perform any social media activity? Okay, what locations opened the email? Okay, so you can actually see a lot of good information here right in MailChimp and you want to be able to react to the emails you send out. So if an email is not performing, okay, you want to learn from that so you don't make the same mistake again. The great thing I like about MailChimp too, they have a lot of nice templates to use. So if you're trying to create a template, here you got some templates that you can leverage. So that's MailChimp kind of in a nutshell. MailChimp, you could pay up front, buy credits, and with those credits, you could send out emails to a number of people. Okay, so that's how MailChimp works. They do have a free trial, so you can set up an account using the free trial. Now, if you need any more information about MailChimp or email marketing in general, take a look at the email marketing webinar we have set up on our Simply Learn YouTube account. Now let's finish up with online PR or press releases. So we talked about SEO and social and search and affiliate and email marketing and, and content native advertising. Let's talk about online PR here because with online PR, it really does involve working with digital publications or blogs or other content related websites. For example, Content related websites could be newspaper, digital newspaper sites like the New York Times. Okay, the whole point of online PR is you want to try and get some publicity on those on those websites. Publicity means awareness for the brand, it means traffic to the website, and eventually some loyalty, future customers, and conversion. Channels that can be used to maximize your online PR efforts. 
For example, you can connect with reporters on social media to develop a relationship. So you can just follow some reporters, see if they're covering specific uh, industries or verticals and if they are similar to what you're offering then it's probably a good idea to reach out to them you can use engaging user reviews to help humanize your brand or you can respond to comments that help generate productive conversations so those are all certain things you can do to generate awareness and buzz for your brand so really the one point thing I want to point out about online PR is Basically, you can also hire a PR firm and they can do some of the heavy lifting for you. Or like I said, you can reach out to different reporters or different influencers even to help push your product or brand. Now, if you're trying to go at it alone on the online PR, what you could do if you don't reach out to reporters or influencers or you're active in trying to build your brand through a conversation, you can always use a third party service like PR.com. So PR.com allows you to, you know, basically create your own profile, you know, submit content to your own profile or even submit press releases. If you submit press releases, then other news agencies are going to pick up on those press releases. So it's a good way to get your press releases out there. Likes of Yahoo and Google might pick up those press releases and give you some, you know, much needed visibility. You can also use other tools like, you know, PR Newswire, for example. So it works in a very similar way. Again, it's a press release distribution network. So you can go ahead and sign up for an account, get that press release out there, and they do the distribution for you. Or you can also use aggregation sites. So there are lots of different aggregate sites out there. And so what aggregate websites do is they help disseminate and distribute your content. So here you can see some of the new aggregator websites of 2019. You got Feedly. Panda, Tech Mimi, Metacritic, eScience News, The Morning News. So you have a lot of options available to get your content out there. Okay, so what these sites do is basically pick up articles that fit their website, fit their theme, fit their target audience. So you do have options in the form of third party tools as well. Okay, so if you don't hire a PR firm, which could be expensive, you can certainly go at it alone by signing up for any one of these particular products or services. Okay, so well, that'll do it for today's webinar. I wanna thank you for hanging in there, going over all these digital marketing channels with me. If you have any comments on any of them, feel free to add a comment below this video. Otherwise, if you need more information, please visit simplylearn.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you soon. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.